Uh, today, we're going to start with the meditation, and uh, I was thinking to kind of do that pacing where on Tuesdays, we start with the class and end with the meditation, and then on Thursdays, we start with the meditation and finish with the class. So this is my rough plan, just <laughs> in case you were wondering. So we'll start with the meditation, and so if you want to get yourself a nice meditation posture... And this practice will have some prayers, so if you want to be able to see the computer, that might be useful. But if you'd rather just listen, that's okay too. And just take a minute and really stabilize the feeling of your own body in the chair or on the floor. In particular, your spine. and mentally scan up and down your spine, inviting it to come into perfect alignment. And whether it does or not, just imagine that it is so. And you might want to take a few deep intentional breaths to ground yourself. And if your mind is quite busy, it can help to tuck your chin in a little bit more. And if your mind is getting a bit tired, it can help to just slightly raise it. So see what you can do to use your body to support your mind. And then refuge in bodhicitta. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit I create from giving and other perfections, may I attain the state of a Buddha to be able to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit I create from giving and other perfections, may I attain the state of a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, by merit that I create from giving and other perfections, may I attain the state of a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from higher rebirth and the bliss of liberation. May all sentient beings abide in a state of equanimity, free from attachment and hatred, free from holding some close and others distant. And let your mind connect with those. Love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Repeating them back to yourself. To my root guru, the quintessence of all refuge objects, I go for refuge. Please bless my mind with your transforming powers. To my root guru, the quintessence of all refuge objects, I go for refuge. Please bless my mind with your transforming powers. To my root guru, the quintessence of all refuge objects, I go for refuge. Please bless my mind with your transforming powers. Making special connection with the Guru.
and visualize on the crown of my head, seated on a white lotus and moon disc, is the protector, my root guru, Chenrezig. He is white in color and has one face and four arms. The first two hands are joined together at his heart, holding a wish-fulfilling gem. His second right hand holds a crystal rosary, while his second left hand holds a white lotus. He is seated in the cross-legged Vajra posture, clothed in fine silk garments, and is adorned with precious ornaments. And so stabilize the visualization above your crown. Even if it's just a general impression of white, most importantly, connect with the Guru Buddha being present. The syllables Om, Ah, and Hum at his three places emit light that invites Guru Chenrezig from his natural abode. Guru Chenrezig dissolves into the Guru Chenrezig on my crown, who becomes the essence of the three refuges. So placing those three syllables at Chenrezig's crown, throat, and heart, Imagine that it invites all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who are also in the form of Chenrezig to come and merge with the image that you visualized so that they become one. And holding that awareness, add the seven limbs. I prostrate with body, speech, and mind in faith, each and every offering I make, including those really performed and those mentally transformed. I confess all negativities collected from beginningless life in samsara. I rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, by living as our guide until samsara ends. <clears throat> reveal the teachings to all sentient beings. I dedicate my own virtues and those of others to the great enlightenment. By the virtue of offering to you assembly of Buddhas, visualize before me this mandala built on a base resplendent with flowers, saffron and water, incense, and adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. May all beings share in its good effects. Hiram Guratna Mandala Kamniyatayami. To Arya Chenrezig, whose body is pure white, unstained by defilements, whose head is adorned by the fully enlightened Buddha Amitabha. To you who gaze upon all sentient beings with eyes of boundless compassion, I prostrate and visualize a stream of the five kinds of nectar, white, red, blue, yellow, and green, pours from the heart of Chenrezig and enters the crown of my head. The nectar purifies all delusions, obscurations, and their latencies, and I receive all the blessings. And so take a minute to stabilize that visualization. Chenrezig at your crown, five colored light flowing from him to you, purifying and blessing. The five colored light, in essence, the five wisdoms, purifying your five aggregates, purifying the five delusions.
And holding that visualization as best as you can, we add the long mantra one time. Namo Ratnatraya Yaha Namo Haya Yahana Sagara Verochana Buharatsaya Tatagataya Ahate Samyak Sambudaya Namo Sawa Tatagate Be Ahate be sam yak sam buddha be namo arya habalokite shoraya bodhisattvaya mahasattvaya mahakarunikaya tayata om dara dara diri diri duru duru Ite vate sale sale, pra sale pra sale, kusume kusume, wari ili mili siti solam apanae soham. And add the short mantra. Om mani pen me hum. Om Mani Padme 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 And continue the mantra under your breath, together with the visualization. Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani. And we then imagine that Chenrezig dissolves into light, absorbs into us, blessing our body, speech, and mind. And dedicate. May I quickly become Arya Chenrezig and lead all sentient beings to his enlightened realm. May the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Remembering the emptiness of ourselves, of Chenrezig, of the practice, and its results, all dependently arise. Okay, so you can relax your attention. So sometimes right before the dedication um, is written the dissolution and sometimes not, but uh, always implied.
So if there's been any kind of visualization and then it just kind of does the mantra and then abruptly goes to the dedication, you can always think the Buddha dissolves, absorbs into you, blesses your body, speech, and mind, whether it's specifically written out or not. Or you can also hold awareness that the Buddha is with you, but relax the visualization. Or you can think all of the wisdom beings um, then move from what you visualized here and dissolve into the image that you might have on your altar. So there's a few different kind of like wrapping it ups. And a lot of these short sadhanas don't explicitly say which to do. So you can pick your favorite. They all are fine. <laughs> um, before we kind of get into the new content, I'm curious what you guys' impressions of two words are purification and blessing. When you hear those two words, what do they convey for you? Start with purification. What does it mean? Light coming down, purifying. What does that mean? Either in this context or in general. Yeah, from the chat, it says changing habits, purification, yeah. changing habits, certainly related, certainly related. Yeah. Other thoughts? The four um, opponent powers, opponent powers uh, that uh, the, the thing that is important if you want to purificate purification purification um in its fully fledged form has all four opponent powers complete um and they are for the most part woven into the practice except for the power of uh resolve so if you put them all into our words because that's easier to remember we have refuge and we have regret and we have remedy and we have resolve so refuge is at the very beginning of the practice built right in uh, regret is very quietly and quickly slipped into the seven limb prayer. And so in the seven limb prayer, we often say it quite quickly, don't we? You know, I prostrate with my body, speech and mind. I make every kind of offering. I confess all negativities. I rejoice in all virtues. And you're like, wait, wait, all of them just now. Okay. That was quick, but it's more about the mentality of laying the mind bare in those kind of quick seven limb prayer contexts. Whereas if you're doing a meditation on the seven limbs, you might pause at each line and really give it a lot of time and investment. So in these kind of more uh, group practice settings, or it's just one section before you get to kind of the meat of the practice, you think all negativities, body, speech, and mind from beginningless time, I will not hide them from the guru, Buddha, or myself. Not that I really could. <laughs> Right, but you're having the mind that lays bare. It's like a confessional mind, but without all of that kind of heavy, punishing, guilt ridden baggage you might normally associate with it. Right, so you have refuge, you have regret. And then remedy in this context is the visualization of the five colored light flowing down from Chenrezig. So the remedy is something to shift the pattern or the energy or the just kind of habitual tendencies. And it can take a lot of different forms, the remedy. It's something that stands in opposition to the mistakes that we've made and the negative habits that we have. So the visualization, light flowing down from Chen Rezig together with the mantra, that's the power of the remedy. What's not written explicitly is the power of resolve. So kind of either right before that disillusion process, before the dedication that's not explicitly written, if you wanna take a moment and just think, body, speech, and mind going forward, I'm going to specifically refrain from, say, actions of killing, or and speech, specifically actions of divisiveness, mind, specifically habits of attachment. Say those were your kind of issues today so far, right? Say there was ants in your kitchen, and you were a little careless cleaning up the kitchen, and you went over a couple of them, and you know that's what you need to purify today, your remedy, you know, and everything is related to that, then your resolution is tomorrow while wiping down the kitchen, I will be much more conscious of the ant life, right? And you think, okay, what have I been talking about today? Oh, I was truthful. Yay. Oh, I wasn't harsh. Yay. I wasn't particularly idle. Yay. Oh, I was a bit divisive. It was true, but not helpful. Curses. Okay. Yeah. And so you think tomorrow, 
when I'm speaking with people, particularly watching the divisiveness. And then you think, all right, when I was by myself, what was my mind getting up to? Was it just kind of hunting for things to entertain it or stimulate it? You know, was it hunting for a novel, hunting for a song, hunting for a TV show, hunting for a a video game, hunting for a conversation with a friend? Was my mind just kind of in like hungry, hungry, hungry? Yeah. Okay. That's what was happening today. So tomorrow let's, how long can I stay mindful for? All right. uh, Maybe danger time is like five to nine at night. That's when the mind is kind of happy, relaxed after work. And then it gets into all sorts of mischief. So tomorrow in the danger time frame, I'm going to be doing these things with my mind to counteract the habit of the attachment monster, right? So you're making it finite, you're making it specific, and then the patterns actually have a chance to change. It can be just like 30 seconds in the practice. It doesn't have to be long. It's just reviving what you already want to be doing and reinforcing in a way that's specific. So when all those four opponent powers are complete, right? Refuge, regret, remedy, and resolve. When those four are complete, what that does is it renders the karmic seed unable to bear the fruit of suffering. Mm. Yep, it burns the seed so it's no longer potent. It doesn't mean the seed no longer has any effect whatsoever. There's still imprints and those are only removed way down the track when we're um, on the five paths particularly the fourth path, those get start getting removed a little ways down the track, but um, at least the suffering result isn't going to come once we do that purification. So those four opponent powers are very important or, and I would say, and in a perfect world, you just remember emptiness. Yeah. So the quickest purification is to remember emptiness, but that has to mean that you understand what emptiness is and are applying it appropriately. Yeah. Um, So that's your shortcut. And so that is plugged right in at the end of all dedications, you add remembering emptiness. Sometimes it's explicitly written, sometimes it isn't. So purification is really about definitely, as the person in the chat said, changing habits and patterns, but it's also making sure that our actions don't come back and bite us in a suffering way. And so part of that is an acknowledgement that we are better behaved when we're happy. (laughs) We are less well behaved when we're struggling. That's generally true, though not always true, right? If we're applying mind training, suffering might actually be fuel for practice and compassion and good things. Um, If we're in a really attached happy mood, then the happiness can kind of make us a little bit naughty. So it's not like this is a hard and fast rule. But one of the reasons why suffering in the future is something we want to prevent is that it just makes it harder to focus and practice and be kind at our level. So it's like, give yourself a chance to have a little less rough a time by doing more purification. Yeah, not to say that suffering can't be used, but we've got plenty of seeds we haven't purified yet. Don't worry, like life's hard enough. Give yourself a break, do some purification. Yeah, so purification is one side of this very brief, very sweet visualization. The other side is blessings. Blessings have a lot of different connotations in our culture. Um, What do you think blessing means in Buddhism? What is a blessing? Eleanor. Uh, I have a lot of um, background around blessings and um, I have been really interested to read about blessings kind of in my understanding is about um, Wisdom, wisdom, and um, compassion, like wisdom, like wisdom, a method of combining the two and having that blessing from the deity. You know, like wisdom, blessings for me was always like full of grace. You know, like Catholic blessing. You know, so it's been a long time uh, assimilating a different understanding of what blessing means. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah mm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, Mary. Hi. Um, I, I remember. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Dan Brown. He is a, a teacher. Yeah, and he's a translator also. And he he doesn't say blessings. He says gift waves of influence. 
Far out. <laughs> he defines blessing. So yeah. the, actually at the beginning of every single meditation, he says, imagine the gift waves of influence from the, from the gurus. Yeah. And there's, um, um, definitely that has one of the main points in there and that is influence yeah the main the main word there is influence um in the chat it says uh, connecting with the buddha gurus through their great qualities and actions that give us inspiration yep inspiration is another one inspiration influence yep what, what other connotations do you find specifically buddhist when we talk about blessings yeah thanks for that mary that, that's a nice framing from him Hey, Dan. <laughs> and dependent arising from the chat. Yeah, so blessings is something that is, is interesting because what you want to make sure doesn't happen is that you get in too much of a passive headspace or too much of a beseeching headspace that says, fix me, I'm broken. Yeah, or save me, I'm bad. That is not what we're asking for. What we're saying is, there are qualities that I already want to have. There are qualities I already do have in their infancy. And what I need is more support to grow them. There are ideals I already value and cherish. There are, th there are core values close to my heart. I want to have more deeply, intentionally, consistently. I don't have them as consistently as I would like to. I need support. And there's also, there are things I completely agree with, but seem to not be able to do, right? Maybe something as simple as, I'd like to be patient. I think patience is important. Yes, patience is important. Oh, but I'm very angry. Okay. <laughs> I think it's important. I totally agree with it. Somehow can't do it. There's a disconnect, right? So when we're asking for blessings or when we're receiving blessings, what we're really wanting to do is have that open receptive mind that is ready for a cognitive shift, that is ready to move an intellectual understanding to a heart understanding, and is mm -hmm. really open to the fact that there is, there is influence in the world that has an effect on our mind. And particularly the enlightened beings are one of the most powerful conditions for that. So it's not like they're sprinkling pixie dust on you, you know, making you magic too. It's that they are a powerful condition all the time. But by you saying, please, may I have a blessing? Or you visualizing that blessings are coming, you become open and receptive to, as Mary was saying, influence, or as what was said before, inspiration. So influence and inspiration, it only happen if you want them. <laughs> <laughs> right? You have to want them. You can't be like um, involuntarily influenced or involuntarily inspired. Part of you has to want that. And so part of the prayer process is reminding yourself that you do. Does that make sense? The prayer is, for the most part, you reminding yourself of what you already care about and unlocking that heart so actually the goods can get in and move the mind. So it could be something as simple as something that you've studied many, many times, finally the penny drops, or it has the ring of truth, or you see the influence in your behavior happening spontaneously. And that's not something that is coming without a cause. This is the result of merit. What is merit? Positive karma, mental momentum. So all of your positive aspirations and prayers and meditations and study and conversations and service and all the good stuff builds a critical mass of merit. And that merit meets the condition of the blessings of the Buddhas and your mind shifts. So it's a collaborative process. It's a meeting of minds. Yeah. So all of that is just kind of background knowing to have, but then when you're doing a sweet little sadhana like this, it's just light and mantras. Yeah, but the light and mantras carry more weight if you're understanding the behind the scenes mechanisms of what the intention is. And it also becomes a less passive experience. So do you have any thoughts or questions about blessings and purification and how that all works with Tantra? Additions? D does it make sense?
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, some. <laughs> Yeah, it, yes, Nay, go ahead. I was just going to say, I always have this mental block with purification because, like, I understand the words, but in my mind, I still have this feeling that, you know, karma is definite. Like, it can't be, like, it cannot be changed. And how can just like visualizing lights or, you know, uh, saying, like the four opponent part, like how does that actually change what I did? Like I did what I did and it yeah. has consequences and how can just, so so it, there is a disconnect I think between sort of what I understand, what I, I actually believe, like I think I don't believe it really, like that connection is so tenuous to me. Like I take it on faith. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, is a really good point that you're making. And I, I think that, and it ties into, there was a question in the chat about what about emptiness? How does that fit with all of this? And we have to remember that when we read in the Lamrim Chenmo, the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, when we read karma is definite, what we need to understand from that is that negative actions are the things that cause suffering. Positive actions are the things that cause happiness. Not that it's definite in the sense of you are fated to have those mm -hmm. because you can destroy positive karma as well, right? You can have like reverse purification, right? With strong, fierce, intentional hatred and anger, you destroy positive karmic seeds and they can't bear the fruit of happiness, right? So we have to remember that karma is dependently arisen and purification is dependently arisen. That none of this is static or stuck in time or permanent, that these are all moving mental phenomena. And just because a seed has been planted on your continuum doesn't mean it's somehow now destiny. Because we have more seed, karmic seeds than we could possibly count. And they haven't yet blossomed into anything because they haven't met with the right conditions yet. It's almost a little bit like if you put it into like tangible, physical, materialistic terms, which is, of course, a little dangerous to do because that's our tendency anyway. But just as an example, like think if you have the genetic disposition for something like cancer, but it's not the type of cancer that is like ripened by um uh, just by itself. It's the sort of karma that's ripened by um, smoking and eating unhealthily. So lots of people don't eat healthy and smoke like chimneys and never get cancer, right? Because they don't have the genetic predisposition for those activities to trigger that genetic thing. But some people have the genetics to have cancer, but not just inevitably. They have the genetics for it if behavior and lifestyle choices trigger it. And then, of course, there's some people who are going to have cancer regardless because it's that kind of genetic, right? And like, you know, don't ask me deep questions about science. You can go do some cool research about it and, and find out better what I'm talking about. But I think we have this kind of general understanding of the different kinds of cancer and the different things that trigger it. Use it as a metaphor, but just kind of think that karma is a little bit like that, where these seeds are hanging out, but they need conditions to ripen them. And if they don't come across conditions to ripen them, they just hang out. But preemptively, before they ripen, we can do things to destroy them. It's just once they've blossomed, they kind of have their own lifespan, and we need to ride them out with some kind of grace and some sort of patience so that we don't create more of the same. And that's where we really apply things like lojong mind training. So it's like once the karma is ripened and the sufferings occurred, there's very little you can do to um, stop it once it's got a head of steam, it's, it's ripened. But you can do a lot during that suffering time to not create more of the same and to actually create a lot of virtue on the back of that kind of condition. So, so just kind of like try not to make karmic seeds too static. Really think of them as real seeds real, you know, and because they are real seeds, they're just mental. And like real seeds, they're a potential, not a destiny. If a seed is never watered, it's never going to sprout. If a seed gets burnt by fire, it can't sprout even if it's watered. So too karma. Yeah. And the, the truth that you want to keep that you're touching on is that, yeah, but the consequences in this life, like 
a difficulty in a relationship, if you've been really harsh to someone, those consequences are still going to play out. But what we need to remember is that the surface conditions and the deep substantial causes are different things. Because there has no doubt been times when someone has been very critical to you and it didn't land because you saw their suffering, because they didn't have an influence on you because of so many conditions, but really the substantial cause for you to suffer in that way wasn't there. So it couldn't ripen just because they were critical. Yeah, they didn't, you know, there was nothing, there was nothing to water in that moment. Right. And then there's probably also been times when someone sounded critical and didn't even mean to be. They had no intention to be harsh whatsoever. But because you had that little seed of your own criticism so habitually from beginning this time that it watered something, even without them meaning to hurt you, you were hurt. So we have to remember the difference between conditions and causes. Any number of things can be a condition for various seeds within us to ripen. But what ripens is based on what we have created specifically. Yeah. So, you know, once the drama of life is playing out, indeed, that drama of life is playing out. But the way in which it play, plays out, a lot of that is a lot more karmically nuanced than we realized. We think it's definite for certain things to go a certain way. And that's not always true. Yeah. If the cause isn't there. So remember that karma is more subtle than emptiness. It seems like it wouldn't be because intellectually it's easier to understand negative actions lead to suffering, positive actions lead to happiness. Intellectually, that's an easy concept to get your head around. But all of the multiplicities of causation is almost infinite. And so when we're talking about emptiness, how does emptiness play into things? Emptiness is empty because why? We have to always finish the sentence. What are things empty of and why are they empty of that? Things are empty of inherence, right? But if inherence doesn't convey any kind of meaning to you, substitute it for independence. Yeah, it's not quite as subtle, but it's pointing the right direction. Nothing is independent. Nothing is causeless. I mean, there are a few things that are sort of causeless in the like, you know, uncompounded space sort of situation, but the things that cause us trouble, they are not causeless, right? There is nothing that exists spontaneously out of nowhere, divorced from any kind of context or reference, right? Things are empty because they're not independent. What they're empty of is independence, of inherence, of self-existence. Yeah, of existing from their own side in and of themselves. Yeah. And so the reason that they're empty is because they are dependent, not independent. They are dependently arisen. Yeah, they arise in dependence upon causes and conditions, parts and context, mind's imputation, a valid basis. So many things come together for something to arise and be labeled and then responded to and experienced, right? It's so subtle. So looking at the, the relationship between karma and emptiness is really important, but remember that neither of them are things that we're gonna be able to access directly for some time. Emptiness, we might actually be able to access maybe in this lifetime, we might be able to have a meditation and experience emptiness directly. But even if we realize emptiness directly in this life, on the meditation cushion, it will appear to us. Off the meditation, it will no longer appear to us. We'll just remember it, and that will make life a lot less problematic. But things will still appear to be inherently existent or independently existent. They'll still look that way. We just won't believe it so badly. And it'll be way until we're fully enlightened Buddhas that we're going to see the whole spectrum of causation and karma. So, you know, if it helps put it into scientific terms or biological terms, just about how is anything ever created? Yeah. And just even like one tiny thing, like the fabric in your clothes, could you trace down every single atom of it, let alone your mind, let alone anything else? I don't, I don't know if that helps. Now, are you feeling, is the doubt? Oh, it helps a lot. I think you said so many important things that I'll have to re-listen again because 
it covered so many of my doubts. Um, and as even as you were speaking, I could I could like start to make a coherent argument for myself that makes sense to me, you know, that I could explain to someone else and it would sound, <laughs> you know, uh, it would sound sensible. Good. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Yeah, no, and very important question and um, keep asking them. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mary. So would you say that emptiness is empty of karma? Emptiness is empty of inherent existence. Yes, that is what it is empty of. And if the word emptiness is the thing that's getting us tangled, which would be very understandable, think that, I don't know, emptiness is more like the lack of intrinsicness. You know, substitute empty with lack. It's mm -hmm. a characteristic that all phenomena lack, but we impute falsely, okay? Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about a characteristic that things lack, it's hard because it's a negation. But the problem is, is that we believe the opposite of what is true. So the way that they describe like after you've realized emptiness is a little bit like how adults can view themselves in the mirror, right? So if you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you see two faces, right? You see, you know your own face and you see another face. You believe there, are, you could believe there are two faces there because of the appearance, but because you're an adult, seeing another face doesn't make you think there's two faces, right? But a cat sees their reflection in a mirror and thinks it's a whole other cat there. And that's a bit like how we are now before realizing emptiness. Mm -hmm. We accept the appearance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now we're accepting the appearances and what we need to do is challenge appearances, knowing that they'll continue to appear that way. But if we can undermine our belief in it, life will be significantly better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and samsara is going to start to run out of gas. So everything lacks the characteristic of inheritance. But it's our particular karma that gives us our particular inheritance or our particular perception of that in, in, inheritance, right? Sort of. Well, our, our karmic disposition or our karmic conditioning certainly gives us a lot of unique things, but the karma itself can came from the innate ignorance that we all have identically, the innate ignorance that believes the inherent existence. Yeah, that grasps that inherent existence. And then all of our behaviors and choices from beginningless time having been colored by that ignorance means that our karmas are actually fairly similar to one another, even though there's like slight details that are different. At the end of the day, we're still having very similar projections. Mm. But, you know, there's certainly unique things like, um, you know, even just from socialization, never mind karma, you know, that like, for example, you see somebody's face pop into the Zoom. Some of us will say, oh, that's a friendly face. And others have also say, oh, that's an annoying face. Same face, different reactions. Are mm. our reactions coming from karma or are they coming from socialization? They're coming from both right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we can start to adjust those. But the problem would be is if we thought our opinion is definite, our opinion is the only truth. And also that our opinion can't possibly change because it's so a sort of substantial truth. We see that person's face, that's an annoying face. They're an annoying person. And then all the whole story rolls along and you create more karmic seeds to see more annoying people. Even if everyone's great, we've just ruined it for ourselves. Mm. Yeah. So, so certainly there's individual kinds of projection related to socialization and from our karma, but mm -hmm. I think that we want to make sure we don't think that karma itself is the one exception. Like karma could be inherently existent. Absolutely not. Yeah. And understanding the way those two go together is one of the hardest and subtlest philosophical points. So if you're not getting your head around it immediately, welcome to the journey. <laughs> it's going to take us all a while. Yeah. Um, it's, I find it difficult to express this, but um, looking at, um, at how we, how we come into existence, you know, like from a microcosm or from the causes and conditions that caused 
different changes different, right from beginningless time. When was it that um, the obscurations came into existence? That's that, <laughs> the whole time, <laughs> Eleanor, the whole time. <laughs> I, I find that so difficult to kind of get my head around. Well, it, it somehow know, makes better like If we started from nothing, what well, I mean, yeah. I, you know, yeah, we like didn't start I, from nothing. We just didn't no. start. That's the hard part. We didn't start. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, beginning as human was beings. I understand oh, as that. Beings. Yeah. As human yeah, beings. Explicitly human beings. beings. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I missed that. I was talking and I missed it. We, we believe in evolution, not to fear not to fear. We believe in evolution. Yeah. Um, you know, the, but the thing is, is that we weren't always human. We were other things. No. We ignorance the whole time, the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Pre-human humans always had ignorance. It's not like, like, I don't know, cavemen didn't have ignorance and then we grew it or something. We've had it the whole time. Mm, I have to think yeah. about it. <laughs> okay, definitely have to think about it. But like, don't don't take my word for it. Sit with what makes more sense. That we were fine, happy, unobscured, not ignorant, and we just suddenly got ignorant, and then like I don't know, just went nuts. Or does it make more sense that the human, or not? Excuse me, not the human. That consciousness in general has always. Yeah with it an innate ignorance that was confused about its relation to others and based on its confusion in relation to others it's built a series of habits over time which have created a series of rebirths and projections and suffering but the nature of consciousness has never been tainted by that ignorance it's just always carried it so it's removable it's completely removable. It hasn't entered into the essence of mind, but it's been there the whole time. We've we've been mistaken the whole time. It's not like original sin. It's not like we've been bad the whole time. We've been fuddled, <laughs> all right? We've been all fuddled and confused and we've thinking that we're so intrinsically separate and then we have to start wars to feel safe and we have to start love affairs to feel loved and we have to you know, eat too much and all sorts of things. It makes sense given our habit of dualistic thinking. Yeah. But to undermine it, if you were to actually cut that habit of ignorance from its root, you wouldn't then regain ignorance later. It's like you couldn't under unlearn the wisdom once you actually get to a realization. It's just for us so far, we've only had intellectual understandings or maybe little snapshots of some kind of experience, but it hasn't been stable and it hasn't been consistent. So I think the teachings on dependent arising have the ring of truth for us. There's part of us that has kind of known the whole time that the way we see life is not complete. Yeah, or that the way we see life has had problems with it. There's like part of us that kind of already has known that even before we met Buddhism, don't you think? Mm. But it wasn't enough to like break the spell. Yeah, it wasn't quite enough to break the spell. And so we need a lot more just study meditation, study meditation, lots of practice, lots of thought about it. But the ignorance is not a badness, it's a confusion. And then because of confusion, we've made so many mistakes but it's not endless. Yeah, so remember how I always say that the mind has good news and bad news and neutral news, right? That the bad news is that all of our consciousnesses have innate ignorance, but the good news is that all of our consciousnesses have Buddha nature. Hmm. And the neutral news is that the mind is just clarity and awareness, which is able to hold objects, but it's a trainable thing. It's a trainable thing. So a little bit of Tantra is using the fact that we already project and changing the projection to something that is a perfected projection. And it's actually closer to truth than our regular projections. It feels like it's a fantasy on top of the ignorance. Sometimes it feels like you're putting on like a Chenrezig suit over the top of your garbage body, right? Like you're just not helping at all. You're just like covering the mess. And it's not that at all. What you're doing with Tantra is actually identifying as what your potential is to be. But right now, as an ordinary person, we identify as things that are not us at all. We identify as our mistakes and our triumphs and our personality and our, 
I don't know, our cultural, our gender, our identification of how smart we are, what our economic status is, what our job is, if we're a mother, if we're a father, whatever, like all of those things that are just components of what we label self onto, we see as self-existent or intrinsic parts of ourself. And all of those are just dependently arisen that exist in a context and are fairly new to this particular rebirth. If you're to identify as the Buddha, that's actually possible and you're already moving in that direction. If you identify as ordinary, that's actually just like identifying with the facade. Yeah. So it's it's just, you know, thought experiments, play around with it. Think about what the consequence of each way of thinking would be and how that would play out in life and, um, you know, make it your own. But uh, human beings have always had ignorance because consciousness has always had ignorance. But it doesn't mean it always will. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so then the other, there's a question in the chat is the question about emptiness and blessings um, was more about um, in accordance with the Madhyamaka Prasangika, I'm assuming. Um, it's blessings, again, they're just dependently arisen. That would be the prasangika view. Yep, everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. That's the classic king of reasons from Lama Tsongkhapa as clarified by scholars like Arya Nagajuna, etc. So blessings to everything. Yep, empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. The danger is thinking that emptiness means stuck or non-existent or has to be as it is or has no meaning or something and we bring all sorts of strange connotations to the word emptiness and it would be better if we had a different word but we really don't but remember the whole sentence empty of inherence why because dependent dependent yeah when we say oh everything is it dependently uh, uh, arise and empty of inherent existence. Mm, uh, how can we explain like for a, a per, uh, like personal, uh, not personal Buddha, but uh, historical Buddha, that we said that they have all, always been uh, before him, before Shakyamuni Buddha, there there been all the Buddhas too, but uh, uh, um, it's difficult for me to understand um, that he, like he is, he depends on something else to appear. And it makes it like, for me, it's weird. Is it that because they exist, but we can't see them because we don't have uh, the merit of seeing them, recognizing them, or it's there, there were many thoughts in there, Ladan, many thoughts. Um, one is, uh, has was the Buddha always a Buddha? No, the Buddha had to learn and develop along the path to enlightenment and become enlightened. Um, if we're talking about primordial Buddha, like Samadabhadra, then maybe primordial Buddha conversation, Samadabhadra conversation is like a total rabbit hole of like needs several like eons to discuss or at least a few more hours so you know i'm sure there's a good wikipedia article or like look at the burrs and archive okay samadabhadra mm -hmm. primordial buddha mm -hmm. but shakyamuni buddha the historical buddha some scholars say he was already enlightened and showed the aspect of being a regular person and going through the 12 deeds of a buddha in order to model a path that we should follow some scholars say he was in fact an ordinary person and did in fact go through those stages and became enlightened for the first time in that life. Either way, at one point he was regular, now he's all better, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. So either way, um, this was an ordinary person who developed their mind. Yeah, and this is the whole point of all of this is that if our minds were inherently existent, they could not be influenced or changed. It would be terrible news. Yeah, but our minds are empty of inherent existence, which means we can transform them. Yeah, we need we need different conditions. Yeah. So so you know, if you if you kind of sit with what's what's your main doubt, like what's kind of giving you resistance or worry and clarify that and then ask again later for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yeah. I will okay. think about it for sure. Yeah, no Thank worries. You. Sure. Okay, we'll have a short break and then we'll do some more content. So now we'll um, finish up the conversation on Chenrezig, but uh, before we do that, I just wanted to explain a little bit about the retreat that's coming up, not this weekend, but the following weekend, which is in a way like a standalone thing that's not necessarily related to the book, although it, for those of you that have been reading the book, it's going to go quite well. So it's like a companion to this course, but if you're not able to come, it's not like you're going to miss out on tons of stuff. Yeah, if that makes sense. So it's mainly going to be practice. And we'll be practicing the two Chenrezig practices that we've already done, plus a couple of more. And then we'll be doing Manjushri next week in class, and we'll add a Manjushri meditation to the retreat as well. So the retreat will be Chenrezig and Manjushri and a little bit of Q&A and discussion. And it'll also have one class a day that will be um, kind of review and deepening knowledge. So it's just a way of having more experience with these practices. Um, let's see, in the chat it says, it'll be available on Zoom. Yep, and so I'll stream it on Zoom. And um, I won't be quite as close to you as I am now. I'll have the computer a little farther away. Um, there won't be share screen. What I'll do is I'll email you all the texts that I'm using, and it'll be up to you to put the PDF up on your screen or to print it out or to have it on a tablet. Um, and uh, so it'll all be good to go there. And um, it, those of you that join via Zoom will send you the schedule and all the same materials that the people in person will have. So um, it will be recorded. Um, and you'll be taking precepts or anything? Pre precepts? Precepts? No, we're not going to take precepts. Um, but if you're in the mood, by all means. <laughs> by all means. Yeah. Um, it's going to be quite like a normal tantra retreat in terms of um, a lot of sitting but it's a little bit more gentle because there's going to be some new people there so we'll just do a few bits about chin resig and call it a night so um, as we talked about on tuesday generally speaking chen resig is the buddha of compassion and omani pemehum means wisdom and compassion must be united for enlightenment so you know if nothing else know that then the details, okay? So Chenrezig or Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, the most common question is why the antelope skin? You know, that seems kind of anti-Buddhist and kind of weird. And we might hear, oh, it's a reference to compassion, but still you're like, but why? <laughs> and the idea is that compassion, that antelopes are supposed to be so compassionate that it said that an antelope will stand between a hunter and his prey and offer itself to the hunter in place of the other animal. And there's even folk stories around Chenrezig folk stories um, of times when that happened and times when Chenrezig manifested as an antelope and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, being from Montana, I have doubt about this because I have seen antelope all my childhood and they just seem like small cute deer. Um, so whether they are in fact compassionate in nature isn't really the point. The point is what they represent. So if you're thinking about someone who is so compassionate that they would stand between a hunter and his prey and offer themselves up, that's the kind of compassion that we're aiming towards. And that's what that image represents. And then this most famous patron deity of Tibet, Chenrezig, the embodiment of all the Buddha's compassion, holds in his hands a wish-fulfilling jewel. So a wish-fulfilling jewel was this folk story idea of literally a jewel that would do whatever you wanted. You know, every kind of material wealth, every kind of resource. What could possibly be more important than a wish-fulfilling jewel? Compassion. Right. So compassion fulfills the wishes of sentient beings because it creates the cause for lasting happiness. And then the outer left hand holds an Utpala flower with two buds, some symbolizing knowledge of the three times, past, present and future. 
And the Utpala flower itself or the lotus flower itself always indicates wisdom as well, particularly the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. And then his outer right hand holds a crystal rosary, reminding practitioners to repeat the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. So these four arms are also representing the four immeasurable thoughts. Um, so that's a nice part of, you know, specifically forearm Chenrezig. As we talked about before, there are many different versions of Chenrezig, Thousand Arm Chenrezig, Siganada Chenrezig, uh, Mahakala, Zambala, all these different forms of Chenrezig. This particular form, the four arms represent the four immeasurables, which are immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, and immeasurable equanimity. And so these are both meditative absorptions and core values to cultivate and general attitudes to have. But I think these four are very accessible to us. Yeah, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, what could be more relatable? So when you see those four arms, you can also think that. And then the six syllable mantra, each of the six syllables destroys the continuity of the six root delusions attachment, anger, ignorance, pride, doubt, and wrong view. So when we say mantra, here, mind protection. Mind protection and mantra could be seen as synonymous. And what it does is it interrupts or is like a circuit breaker for the continuity of these negative habits. And it also purifies the tendency for them to arise. And then on the other side, it creates the the conditions to attain the six perfections of a bodhisattva, these attitudes and activities of someone with this altruistic motivation. So we have charity or generosity, morality or ethics, patience, or sometimes translated as forbearance, perseverance, which is also joyous effort or enthusiasm, and then concentration and wisdom. So these six perfections you see all over the place, but it's nice to think each of the six syllables purifies the six baddies, helps attain the six goodies. Just that alone kind of gives you more oomph and connection with the practice. If just thinking it's wisdom and compassion combined is not enough to kind of help you feel engaged. And then reciting the six syllable mantra allows us to achieve the highest realizations and progress through the five paths necessary to attain enlightenment. So it's giving you the merit, the momentum to go through all five paths, the paths of merit, preparation, seeing, meditation, and no more learning, which is enlightenment. And this is straight from the text, but just to kind of like keep us grounded in what the five paths are, or if you haven't read about them before, kind of a quick um, introduction. Oh, and there was a question in the chat, which is what is the symbol in the middle? Um, the symbol in the middle is the seed syllable, hri, which is like the essence of the mantra. Okay, so the five paths in brief, okay, and this is a very long conversation, but in brief, are the stages of development you go through once you've realized the determination to be free renunciation and bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. So the paths begin once you have uncontrived bodhicitta and uncontrived renunciation, and that begins the path of accumulation. And here you're accumulating merit, so that's why it's sometimes also called the path of merit. And when you're accumulating merit, you're accumulating it in the method side, the compassion side that we talked about Tuesday, and the wisdom side as well. It's a two accumulations. And then when you're accumulating and accumulating, you eventually arrive at the path of preparation because you're preparing to see emptiness directly. And here what's emphasized are those two practices of developing calm abiding and special insight. And so when you have calm abiding and special insight, the powers of stability and the powers of analysis united on the emptiness of inherent existence, that's when you achieve the path of preparation once that's conceptually grounded. When it moves from conception to perception and is direct, the union of calm abiding and special insight focused on emptiness becomes the beginning of the path of seeing because you see emptiness directly. 
And this is the shortest of all the paths. This is, you know, you're sitting, you realize emptiness, you're in subsequent attainment, and then on to the path of meditation, which is basically repeating and repeating and repeating your realization of emptiness, purifying eons of negative karma. You're clearing all the obscurations of afflictions. And then once you get towards the end of the path of meditation, you're clearing all the obscurations to knowledge until you have completely cleared all of the obscurations and achieved the path of no more learning, which is Buddhahood. So this five paths is something that's going to keep coming up again and again when you're learning about Buddhist philosophy. When we're talking about the mantra, just feel that it plants the seeds for these to be so, creates merit for these to be so, helps our momentum and our ability to engage with these. So the six syllable mantra of Compassion Buddha, O Mani Peme Hum, it contains the entire Buddhist path. So including the four levels of Tantra, Kriya Action Tantra, which is what we've been talking about and what this course is about. This is the lower Tantra. Then we have Charya or Performance Tantra and Yoga or Union Tantra. And those two are very similar to Kriya Tantra very, very similar. There's a few more vows, there's a few more elaborations, and they're not as commonly practiced in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And then there's highest yoga tantra. So lowest tantra and highest tantra are the ones mainly practiced in our tradition, but all four classes of tantra are embodied by or contained within the six syllable mantra. And the six syllables have the power to completely close the door of the six realms meaning we will cease the continuity of taking birth in the six realms. Each of the six syllables has the power to stop us taking birth in any of the six realms, hell, hungry ghost, animal, human, demigod, and god realms. And that's the wheel of life next door, just to remind us of that mess. Okay, and so then we'll go through, you know, Om, Mani, Padme, Hum, you know, each one, and you can have a look at the notes to see all of those. But basically, everything in Buddhism is contained within the base of the two truths, conventional truth and ultimate truth. And so the mani refers to conventional truth, which is all obscuring truth, because although true on one level, it obscures the ultimate nature of reality, which is ultimate truth. And then padme refers to ultimate truth. So mani padme contains the whole of the Buddha Dharma which is the base, the two truths, the path, method and wisdom, and the goal to be achieved, the rupakaya or form body, and the dharmakaya, the truth body of the Buddha. So Mani leads us to the rupakaya, Padme leads us to the dharmakaya. So all of this is just to say that, you know, you'll find again and again, each explanation of each mantra is going to say, this mantra contains the whole path to enlightenment. And then you'll learn about another mantra. This mantra too contains the whole path to enlightenment. And what about this one? Oh, that one too. Oh, that one too. Wait, they all do. Okay. So why have more than one? The emphasis is slightly different and your karmic affinity might be slightly different and the needs of the people around you might be slightly different. So they're all just different tools to have in your toolbox. But if you only choose one, Omani Pemehum is going to be your go-to. Yeah, Omani Pemehum, particularly because the strength of the karmic connection between Chenrezig and the beings of this age. Um, you know, also important is Medicine Buddha because of the prayers the Medicine Buddha's made to be of benefit during this degenerate age. All mantras are perfect. All mantras work. So some of it just boils down to affinity. And some teachers say that kind of getting into the nitty gritty of every specific meaning of every specific nuance of the mantras can be useful on one sense, but is not entirely necessary. And it can even sometimes be counterproductive because with mantra recitation, you're not necessarily needing to engage that specific a level of conceptualization in that process. It's more like the study process of that gives you enthusiasm to then do the practice. But during the practice, you don't need to be thinking about all these things. Just engage with the visualization, the mantra, and stay as steadily with it as you can. 
Does that make sense? So learning about all the whys and what's useful for building enthusiasm, but not necessary for doing the practice itself. So, and we'll go ahead and dedicate. Janchu Sancho Rinpoche, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyochi, Ke Panyam Pa Me Pa Yin, Gone Gondu Pawa Show, Doni Dawa Rinpoche, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyochi, Ke Panam Pa Me Pa Yin, Gone Gondu Pawa Show. Okay, thanks everyone. See you Tuesday. Thank you, Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.